good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever it is you're tuning in from. My name is Sarah Caitlin. Yes, that is a double name like Sarah Catherine, Mary Margaret, or Mary Beth. And I'm sitting here today with the wonderfully talented Taylor Hickson, who plays Rail Collar on Motherland Port Salem. Thank you so much again, Taylor, for taking the time out of your day to sit and chat with me. It is so good to see your smiling face again. Thank you so much. I know uh, the, the convention was so busy, so I'm so glad that we got to a lot of time to actually just have uh, more or less, you know, a sit down conversation with each other and, um, and really get to connect. So thank you so much for absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So you, you and I did meet at a convention this year in May mm -hmm. called QFX East, which was in Tampa. Yes. And uh, you and I got to hang out for a bit, very briefly, uh, at the queer prom, and you just looked so happy to be there. You, you looked incredible, as always. <laughs> Thank you so much. So did you. I mean, everyone, yeah, it was amazing to really, I, I, we've been waiting years, you know, this was our first convention that we got to attend just because of COVID circumstances. So this was the first time that, you know, all of the Twitter handles were put to real life faces, and we could actually hold each other and connect and share space and share energy and that's invaluable. We've been waiting so long to have um, experiences like these. And, you know, it's just the just the beginning, which is a bit ironic considering, you know, the the show itself is coming to a conclusion. But um, it it lives on. It's much more expansive than than just what we're making on the ground. So um, I'm excited to meet more and more people as the as the conventions pop up. Would you be? Would would you be interested in doing another convention, maybe another queer fan convention in the future? Yes, a thousand times yes. I'm doing one in August. Um, not to Clexicon yet, but um, <laughs> but I'm coming to Star Fury, which is in London. It's in London, so uh, I'll get to meet some of the European viewers over there, and yeah, it should be very interesting. It'll be my first time spending time there, so. Um, Hopefully everyone can show me around and help me find good food there. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, be great. <laughs> so, yeah I was going to ask you how, what was the experience like getting to finally be face to face and uh, putting faces tw to Twitter handles and what, what, what kind, what was that kind of like for you getting to all the people telling you stories about, <laughs> did you really connect with people? That's, it just, that just seems so incredible to me. It, it was really surreal, surreal, sorry, and, and vulnerable and emotional. And, um, and yeah, it was nice to just like hold each other. I, I think one of my love languages is so much um, physical touch and neighboring affirmation. So, you know, getting to talk to each other and, and connect and just, you know, share the difficult parts of ourselves and mm -hmm. the excited parts of ourselves. And um, everyone just really was raw with me, which I think um, really speaks a lot, I mean, to our community. And Were there any other guests at QFX that you really kind of enjoyed meeting? Oh, everybody. I mean, I was so, I was so excited to meet everybody. Um, like I know some of the, uh, some of the prom footage went out, but like just really getting to, to dance and, and let go of, you know, all of the heavy stuff that we were talking about during the day. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I had some private one-on-ones where we we shared the, the value of each other to each other and um and then sort of getting to you know have a couple drinks and then just okay. fun and, and share space and laugh and you know like like nothing bad had happened throughout COVID it was just like everything felt normal and everything felt like the way it was meant to be and I felt like I had been holding my breath until I'd physically gotten to this place and gotten to, got to meet everybody um so I'm just so grateful to every single person I met. You know, I had some of the Morgan come in, give me a T-shirt. I had like, there's so many, so many great things that I took home and memories. Oh, that yeah. I that's so that's, grateful to everyone. That's fantastic. I'm so glad you enjoyed yourself. Con conventions really are some of the best places to be on planet Earth for like three or four days at a time. It's a place where, you know, we're all like-minded individuals when we come and we're we're so vulnerable with each other and so open with each other because we know we're safe with each other yes and we know we're loved and to meet the people that we admire and to have them share one-on-one -on -one with us is just their fantastic experiences and they're best had in person so mm -hmm. i would really yes. encourage people to really if you 
you know, with times of COVID virtual conventions, conventions really are best experienced in person. And mm -hmm. I know not a lot of people can make it to do that. Um, uh, but it's, I'm, I, I am glad that we do have opportunities for virtual uh, conventions so that people at home can be able to participate. That's always great. I got to meet so many people worldwide that way. Like they had a, just a little room set aside where, you know, between, um, you know, like photo meets and, and whatnot that we could sort of tuck into these rooms and we'd have these virtual one-on-ones. And that was awesome for me. I know there, I of course won't reveal their identity, but I, I really had someone touch me in, in, in the way where, Oh, I was sobbing, sobbing, like touched me so deeply in sharing their story about, you know, uh, they have a disorder that prevents them from a lot of physical mobility and um, how it's only worsening and, you know, how it's preventing them from taking care of their family and um, it limits them in what, in the way that they can give and then the only way they can sort of sort this is, is just by being physically active all day every day and so they were sort of speaking to me in a pocket of of um working out essentially and you know I was kind of giggling about it and they're like well if I can be real with you you know this is why I do this and um just you know sharing that really really deep um vulnerable scary part of themselves with you know someone who's a total stranger it was just like these there's trust here. There's people who, you know, who really want to connect and they're looking to connect and they feel the fact that they feel safe in, in taking that step is just, it speaks volumes as to how expansive storytelling can be and the people it can bring into a room together, you know? Absolutely. I absolutely agree. That's, you, that's so wonderfully well put. That's great that you could have experiences like that, even, you know, virtually people who can't mm -hmm. make it, it, mm -hmm. Like you said, it speaks volumes to speaks just volumes. how wonderful and how uh, interconnected we all are through one. Yeah. Uh, you did say, I've been waiting to bring this up. You did say <laughs> in an interview last year mm -hmm. that you you envision a kind of future with Rael and Scylla. And I'm going to quote you here. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I'm being held accountable. Help. Uh, you said they're living on a little witch farm with a million little witch babies and that they own pet ducks. First thing, uh, a million little witch babies is rather ambitious, but I'm here for it. And second, Elliot, the show creator, has recently said that um, as far as Rael and Scylla are concerned, they're, they're good now. Like, they're not really wanting to rock that boat of uncertainty anymore. Um, so uh, they very much want to give the fans what they want is rail and Scylla together. Um, and so we feel pretty good and secure in that. So with that being said, is the farm still in the books or maybe do we want to upgrade to a ranch? I mean, ranch never hurt anybody, but a, a, the, a million little witch babies, I mean, they have the facilities, they have the enthusiasm, they have the time. <laughs> I wouldn't, uh, that's still a dream of mine. So I stand by my quote, of I'm being held accountable and I stand by it. You, you, know, you, can, have more, you can have more than just pet ducks. You know that, right? <laughs> I refuse. I refuse <laughs> anything. And else. all the diapers. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness. But everyone can come visit. Everyone can bring their pets. It's a wide open farm. That's, yeah. <laughs> to have lots of land. That sounds great. Whoever it's made that fan art. Well what's that? I said it's a ranch now. We got all the land. All the land. All the animals. Everything. Everything. So, whoever yeah. made that fan art, you've got some work to do. <laughs> have you seen that? Oh, have I? I am I am like the number one stan of this the kind of fan art. My page is a fan page for the art that comes out of this show. Wow. It's a, literally, I'm just like a stan page for all of the the insane amount of talent that watches and enjoys the show. It's insane yeah. to me. Like we're so, I feel so unworthy of the amount of talent and time and energy gone into this stuff. And I'm like, the most I can do is just share it widespread. It's 
brilliant. I can't, I'm so I graciously, I, there aren't, there's not, there's no verbal thanks for the experience that motherland has granted me. It's taught me so much about myself and so much about the rest of the world. And, um, yeah, the fan art is just one small fraction right. of, you know, one of the things that makes our community so amazing and so loving and affectionate and they absolutely care. They just care to the utmost root of the word. There's just so much investment and it's, you know, it's nice to see that, that, you know, the, this is the purpose that I wake up for every day. And to, to see someone connect with that is just mind blowing. There's some incredibly talented fan art oh. artists and digital artists. It's insane. Crazy. Insane. Insane. The amount of like traffic that comes through of just like the, the amount of talent. I can't, I can't even mentally fathom it. It's incredible. I am curious to know what kind of, um, so we're going to dig in more to the show now. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm curious to know what kind of creative freedoms you kind of had with Rael as far as um, over three seasons, <clears throat> as far as maybe flexibility with your lines, uh, the yes. body language, the way she might authentically like interact with other characters. What kind of, were you given that kind of creative space with Rael? Yes. Set? I know um, a lot of networks specifically don't allow for the lenience in, um, you know, line changes or um, intent changes. You know, they want everything really by the book, by the numbers. Super and there's amazing. nothing like that. It was, I, com I commend the, the crew of Motherland for giving us such a safe space as creators to really instill our own... Uh, inflection into the way that we viewed these characters and the way that we felt. And I, there's so much value and thanks to Elliot and, and Amanda and Brian, the whole team for trusting us in the choices we made and, um, you know, taking turns, um, giving information to each other and watching that energy flow and, and manifest itself. You know, it was, it's, it's truly teamwork. It's truly teamwork at its it, core form. It really seems like it. Yeah, it seems like the cast over the years had a, a lot of room to really play with their characters really? in that way. And I think that's so, what really translates so effortlessly on screen. I think that's, you know, it, it was that trust in each other that allowed for something that sh that wears itself as organic and authentic is because it it felt that way. They trusted the way that we approach things and if something felt uncomfortable or clumsy in our mouths or in our body language, they said, how can we make this better for you? How can we, how can we change? And vice versa, you know, we, it's great. we allowed the space to, to do that and the flexibility and um, to push each other and uh, challenge each other and know when to listen and know when to speak. And yeah, just, it's, it's a back and forth. It's a balance. It's a push and pull. And I think there was just the right amount of understanding it was, it was uh, its own language for sure. That's, that's so good to like, I'm glad I asked that question because I feel like I was right. I'm glad you asked that too. <laughs> it's very, it's very observant <laughs> thing to, to recognize um, and to acknowledge. So thank you. I don't think I've really gotten a question like that before, but it's, oh, wow. it's, something, <laughs> it's something that I admire so much about Motherland was, you know, the creative freedom. Um, I don't think I would work so well under a microscope and I don't think you would have had near the same product if, if y'all didn't trust each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm sure it helps to have such a great bond with your castmates, too. I've heard that <laughs> in season one, um, Amalia picking you up and spinning you around in that one scene. Um, yes. One of the first few episodes, that was just y'all, that was not, that was unscripted. That was just y'all playing no. around. There's always, there's so much play. Like a lot of the, I mean, unless they're really centered significant kisses and you know they really make a moment out of it it's it's not a lot of the stuff isn't written like the the in between touch or even things that happen off screen between mm -hmm. myself and 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 the cast you know like sometimes we have offhand conversations that aren't you know uh, audible to the camera just because of what it's focusing on but mm -hmm. we always have our things that are are sort of busy and working just to to help the 
to help the dynamic feel real, to help to really center ourselves, to feel present, to feel engaged no matter where we are or where the focus is in the scene, um, to always feel like we're engaging and we're adding something to the dynamic and the environment because that's lifelike and that's yeah. you want people to feel like they can relate to it. And I think the less lifelike it is, the, the mm. further away the connection is, the further the reach. So, um, you know, it's, it's just little things like that, really, really caring about the, the end product and, and just the enthusiasm of being engaged helps, I think, the entire team feel like they're contributing something and that they have a purpose to be there. Um, yeah, just all these, like, there's so many little unscripted things or, you know, little lines or t talking, touching, uh, play. A lot of that's just, it's, it's not scripted. It's just to contribute. That, I, I mean, that blows me away because you, I don't know about anybody else, but I know for me personally, when I'm watching content that um, I can really just, I, I do feel like it is the responsibility of you know the person in a role to obviously make the scene or there's they, what they're doing believable obviously but you, I can really kind of tell when especially if it's certain scenes like you know if there's kissing involved or as far as other shows I'm not talking about motherland yeah yeah um, that are super just rigid and there's not a mechanic yeah and um mm. That's, I think, what sets Motherland apart from pretty much anything else that's on TV right now mm -hmm. is that creative freedom that you can, it's visible. I mean, it's, that, like I said, it just, it translates so effortlessly on screen. And I really have to commend you and everybody for that. Mm -hmm. And especially the people who allow you to have that creative space yes. to really move oh. with your character. Yeah, that's, it's but them, that's you know. And I think that, I mean, I, I spoke to Elliot about this the other day during, <laughs> during an interview, but um just the the amount of confidence I think it takes and trust to create something to put your whole heart and mind and body and spirit into something and years and years of work and your own ideas and to just sort of launch them into the world and you know you you have less control over it and I think that understanding of knowing what to hold on to and what to let go of and mm -hmm. how to trust other people and lean on your team it's a difficult choice to make. Like I, I congratulate Elliot so much for doing that because that that's, that's his child. You know, he, yeah. he birthed this thing from a seed in his brain like and just grew it into this massive tree of life. But there's yeah. only so much control you have, you know, squirrels move in and then there's, you have like birds <laughs> Squirrel and babies. are eating you, <laughs> you know, things happen. There's drought, there's, Floods. there's nothing you can do about it but you just sort of have to be present and watch and, and know yeah. what you have control over and, and know what you don't and to just launch that into the world the amount of you know trust and and love he has placed in this and same with brian and the rest of our writers team you know it takes it takes a lot of trust and i think that's a really ever-present theme in in motherland and leaning on each other and knowing that you can't do everything by yourself mm -hmm. And um, and all, all of our individual narratives to control, and um, yeah, it's 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 really interesting to watch that play out. It was just something I was I objectively noticed, but I I congratulate Elliot so much for for doing that and knowing knowing when to trust, and um, I think it really allowed for the bond that was built. That's we, amazing. Uh, yeah, mutual trust in each other. That's that's gotta be a really great job i mean <laughs> it's a great job it's i don't even want to talk about another one. <laughs> oh no yeah um uh i saw i saw the uh another what was it i think it was one of the most recent interviews um somebody had asked amalia uh, uh it was the topic had come up uh who, whoever gets to be your or her next love interest and you were just like no it's yeah, never compared and to us. <laughs> her and I have talked about this a bit. Yeah, we're, we're, we're finding it hard to, I mean, not that there's a need to part with this because uh, I was earlier saying, you know, I, I refuse to say goodbye to mm -hmm. the character. Or these are pieces of me that are coming with me. You know, these things don't die. I think Rail and Scylla are very symbolic to that idea. It's just the, 
the practice of life and death of healing and regeneration and yin and yang, you know, they are the very embodiment of that idea. So, um, in spirit of them, you know, we refuse to, to yeah. part with these oh, characters. Man. And they're so near and dear to your heart. No, I totally get that. Oh, yeah. Um, speaking of creative yeah. freedoms, I also saw, I watch a lot of interviews, okay? Um, <laughs> I also saw that Lynn was the one to bring up the idea of kind of playing with the sexual tension between Tally and, uh, and General Alder. Wild. Um, in, in that uh, dreamscape type mm -hmm. vision via Nikta in season two. Yeah. And uh, that, so that threw me for a loop. Um, Dude, that's going that, right. to live rent free in my head for a long time. Literally. <laughs> I'm a tall blue shipper though. Yes. <laughs> You're barking up the wrong tree. Like I will. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was so like, I was so hooked on the tension of this and watching them play because they are, they both reach to the deepest pits of their emotion when they're in their character. Like they are both so deep as individuals to see that sort of pitted at each other and, and watch it dance and the fluidity of it and that push and pull. And also just that strange, like forbidden fruit. Cause it's kind of, you know, you have your sup superior and then you have the, the, the teacher and the student or you and have she admired her so much another figure and a daughter figure you know this mm -hmm. weird weird complex of <laughs> all of these different dynamics it was just you can't look away yeah um i, I was shook <laughs> these are the kinds of things that they they aren't written and sometimes mm -hmm. just like the complexities written mixed with the complexities added by the performers create this wild blend of of surprise and um that's one of my favorite things about my job is you just you can't plan for it and it's kind of like what you were saying about how you can read when something feels mechanic or rigid you can tell when you come into a room and you're working with an actor whether they have practiced that scene in the mirror 1800 times because they aren't able to adapt so when they're directed they won't be able to shift what they're doing because it's so instilled and so ingrained in them to do the thing they practice with muscle memory and they know mm -hmm. exactly what they're doing because they've watched it in a mirror. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's a practice I have completely avoided is watching yourself because you think too much about it and then mm -hmm. you begin to plan and you're in your own head. The most interesting thing I find to watch is when a performer is gen genuinely listening to what's going on in the scene. Like, you, you know, someone's being authentic when even though the other person's talking, they'll cut to somebody else just listening. And you can see the cogs working. You can see stuff going on behind the eyes. I think that is so interesting because it's not they're being present. It's not mm -hmm. planned. It's not predicted or premeditated. It's you're getting a genuine reaction. I think sometimes that's a lot more interesting to watch than than the actual speaker themselves. No, yeah, I I have to agree. I'd have to agree with you. I I can say that I'm I'm guilty of you know just running over something over and over and over again to, to get it right because yeah, of I'm course, a bit of a perfectionist in that way, especially when it, like I uh, lead into a bunch of my interviews how I do it. I I sign off silly and I sign on silly. Like yeah, it's <laughs> it's it's part of my whole thing. But yes. but there's um, a time and place for that too. But like I used to script everything for my interviews. And I would, I would be like, okay, I want to make sure, like, I say everything I got to say, and I say it. I was so I would write these notes, and I'm like, I want to articulate it this way. Mm -hmm. And then I'm, but sometimes you don't get a genuine flow of conversation because then you're trying to work in information that doesn't fit. Yes. Or you know, so I, I do a bit of both now. Like yeah, I do, I, I have like my my points of order that I want to run through, and then from there <laughs> you can kind of like. And it's good to have, uh, mm -hmm. it's good to be in, in like communicating with somebody who you can like riff with basically. Like how, yes. like I, we, I already knew we got, we got along meeting yes. at, uh, the queer prom at QFX, like, because mm -hmm. we had such a good time. Yes. Uh, but it's, it's a lot easier to elaborate. So I do try to kind of do both. I have, mm -hmm. uh, points that I want to make and get across. And then from those points, we, I kind of try to elaborate and be yeah. present and kind of like 
uh, just be fluid in the conversation like that. So yeah. it's, that makes it's, a good it's interview something right? that I'm constantly working on. Yeah, but the, the, again, so much of your job also requires preparation, but the it's mm -hmm. being adaptive and being, yeah, the ability to adapt, I think, is what really makes something fluid. And I think that's what is more engaging to watch. I think it's it's horribly obvious when something feels mechanic or yeah. sterile or rigid, you know, it, it yeah. takes the emotion out of it. And I think you can't relax because you're focusing so hard on getting a specific kind of product or performance. And um, it takes away from your natural abilities. So, I mean, you know, a lot of the times we're reading our lines while we're getting our makeup done in the morning, you don't, you know, unless it's like this massive scene where it takes a lot of mental uh, preparation and emotional preparation, I think you get the most organic matter by just being like, okay, this is the context. Like I, I probably 90% of the time don't get my lines exactly the way they're written, but the context is there and, and the, the movement of the scene is there, you know, the trajectory of the scene. And I think, I mean, I'm screwed if I ever get a job where they're like, can you say it exactly word for word? <laughs> But yeah, I've been on so lucky with Motherland. Gosh, yeah, I totally know what you mean. Yeah, I've been on some sets, not professionally, just yeah. kind of beside the beside the scenes, behind yeah. the scenes, kind of where I've kind of witnessed that, and I'm like, you can, sure. I can tell when um, when a creative person or an artist or an actor is really kind of struggling because they want to have that fluidity with their reactions or kind of that flexibility with their lines and. You know, some you you have these creative types who they they want they want the scene blocked in a certain way and they want the angles in a certain way and they want the lines in a certain way and yeah the words folding over each other it just they they have to have it. So control. I'm I'm really glad that you did like again I'll say it again I'm really glad that you <laughs> did have kind of that creative freedom Please to move with your characters because it does yeah. it does count and you can totally yeah. tell and it makes it so great to watch it's, it's so fun there's room for play that's the point of the job you know yeah. so you can, a, a lot of the touching and kissing is is improvised between myself and amalia it's just organic and it follows the natural flow of you know w would we give each other a kiss before we say goodbye to each other yeah. Yeah, a lot of this stuff isn't necessarily written but it's you know when you place yourself there and and how you know, how you feel when you're going throughout the scene and what feels like a, a comfortable goodbye or what feels like a comfortable greeting. These are things that feel organic. Oh, and, and just these little contributions from either of us really gave us space to play and it just kept growing from there. That is why the show is just absolutely phenomenal. That's, that's why it has such a big fan base and because people people pick up on stuff like that and they, it's so enjoyable for everybody speaking of lynn <laughs> um we have have we have a short film that she's in called brilliance on our uh on our streaming platform uh, les flicks video on demand oh my have, gosh have you heard of it at all no. it's it's a short film by uh miles roston and um Miles Rawson and Matthew Kerr Lewis. It's super cute. Um, okay. You should ask her about it sometime because <laughs> I absolutely will. I don't know how I miss this. What do you know? What year it was released? It was released in oh girl, you gonna make me look this up? 2016. Oh, just missed it. That's why. Yeah. Okay. It's, like, it's, it's about 13 minutes anywhere. long. It's a super little neat short film, and she's just an absolute delight. What's the sort of context of it? Like, what's the synopsis? You want me to read you the synopsis? Yeah. It's, I might know um, if it's the one I'm thinking of. It's the tagline is six lives collide in a flash of sunshine, bullets, and jewels. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, and the synopsis is in his, uh, I'm not sure how you pronounce this word. I'm going to try it though. <laughs> in his, atel mm, it's A T E L I E R. Atelier. Atelier? I think so. Maybe. Let's go with that. Um, yeah. Atelier. My apologies to the French language. Um, <laughs> Master jeweler William rushes to finish a creation for his client Felice, but neither will admit that they're in love. I'm reading this off of our um, Lesflix has uh, the world's largest sapphic film database. So any 
any film, short, or series, uh, Motherland Fort Salem is on here. Um, oh my God, any, I'm nervous. Congratulations. Of <laughs> sapphic, uh, women loving women, any type of lesbian or bisexual, transgender, queer oh, character yeah. is on this database. Um, the synopsis goes on to read uh, to say outside, small time thief Josh quarrels with his gunman partner Bart while preparing to rob William. Upstairs, Janet who is, uh, that is the role played by Lynn, um, has been so hurt by her girlfriend, she's taking desperate measures until Marlene's, the girlfriend, until Marlene or Marlene's arrival in the square changes everything. It's, yeah, it's a short, it's about 13 minutes long, and I've seen it like 20 times. It's so good. Okay. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm a diehard fan of Lynn, so I will watch anything she's in. So say less. I'm curious to, yeah, I've always kind of wanted to ask her about it. I didn't have time to, like, catch her while we were at QFX, but I was like, ah, oh, she's right oh. there. I'm walking past her. Can I? Okay. Glittery soul. I mean, I couldn't tell you how scared shitless I was the first day I met her. And then after maybe a couple of weeks, you know, we really, she just let go one day and we really saw her goofy side. And I said, oh, look, she's one of us. Yeah. You can't believe she's one of us. Like she's so goofy, but just so wise and carries the the essence of youth and play with her. But just she's so professional and so intelligent, so well spoken. I mm -hmm. I can't say enough great things about Lynn. She's she's one of the many women on our set that I admire so deeply. I yeah, I may be a little a little bit in love with her. Um, she's <laughs> <Sorry, amazing. laughs> You can join the fan club. We have jackets. <laughs> Send me one. Um, <laughs> uh, and I wanted to talk about Tally a little bit. I mm. so in season one, Tally was my sorry. Tally was my favorite character. Um, she has such. She's already kind of had a little bit of a character arc um, as far as season one and season two. Mm. I just have a feeling. So Tally to me, she's like the golden retriever of wishes. No matter what happens, you can just never be disappointed with her. Um, but so that's 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 also something I kind of want to see going into season three, considering she's already had kind of a bit of a character arc. Mm -hmm. I just have a feeling that there's there's a gonna there's gonna be another turning point to come for her is she capable of making a bad decision what does that look like I feel like we might get to see a, a bit of a dark side with her especially now that she has this kind of bond this mm -hmm. thing going on with Nikta mm -hmm. like what, yes. what do you think I mean she's got a lot of heavy responsibility I think on her shoulders throughout season three and um, the fate of well almost everything is reliant on how far she can see and what she can see and what that means and how we can manipulate our situations to get the result we want. And that's impossible to know. So it's a, you know, it's a lot about trust um, and teamwork and oh, I'm like, what can I say without giving any of this away? But um, yeah, a lot of the story arc is, is heavy on, Tally's shoulders and okay. uh, yeah that's that's kind of what Arlen kind of also alluded to in the yeah, um, um in the interview I got with her uh she, yeah. she did kind of mention that uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you are are there any stories from the set over the past three seasons that you are that you find particularly memorable um okay there was one <laughs> tell me there was one thing that we did. We got in so much trouble for this. Yes, so okay. much trouble. So it was season two. So I think it was last year. And it was like peak COVID. Everyone was being tested. Like all of our background were being tested in pods. And they all had numbered pods. And no one could go near each other. And the minute you cut, you pull out your mask. You know, everyone was sanitizing. Everything was social distancing. We, we were so adamant on not being taken down and, uh, and being put out for a couple of weeks for quarantine. Oh, yeah. We were so close to the end and trying to make it through without, we, I think we didn't get one positive test. We didn't have anything shut down our, our uh, season for the entirety of season two. Our show stayed up. Thank goodness. 
So this was a big problem when this happened. Um, I think we were shooting episode nine or 10, maybe nine. Um, we were in the airplane hangar where Nikta is meant to be killed and they call the right of proxy. Mm -hmm. Uh, so during the scene, there were so many people there and we had been shooting the scene for days and the, the, the tension was so heavy and there were so many emotions and we were kind of on our last few shots of this. So one of our camera team pulls me aside and there were so many people here. We had a PA system with a megaphone. So when he pulled me aside, he said, hey, do you want to surprise Lynn when she walks out of the airplane hangar? We all break into dance and song, so she has no idea what's going on. I said, absolutely, I want to do that. She's had the craziest couple of days, and she's just put so much of her heart in it. And oh, yes. She's voiced a bit, and, you know, so I was like, let's make, let's finish this light and fun. Mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking about COVID. And so we got, we got to the end, and she begins walking out, and I cued um, September by Earth, Wind, and Fire. and. They had every like the camera up on the crane and we did a massive dance number. We all broke out into dance and everyone sort of, you know, came off the bleachers and we had this whole pit and no one was wearing masks and we weren't thinking about it. And Lynn turned around thinking like, how dare someone play music over the scene before she realized what was happening? And she went, ah, and she ran in and we were all having this massive like mosh pit of dance. And it was this first breath of relief that we had had the entire season because we were all working so diligently to keep each other safe the COVID team yeah. was working so hard yeah to keep everybody safe and keep the show going and we really put that in jeopardy so big apology to that but I think everyone the entire crew you know was getting in there and um I it was it was that <laughs> so much fun but we got so, so much trouble my next question obviously is uh is there any footage of this there is footage i don't know where the footage is i think everyone pretended like it didn't happen so we're gonna get shut down <laughs> it's, it's it's out there now so yeah, it's out there now but like <laughs> We're allowed to talk about it now, but like at the time they were like, this didn't happen. I can't uh, believe you guys did this. We were like, we're so sorry, guys. I know. <laughs> That's incredible. We're dumb little kids. We were, it was terrible. It was <laughs> so bad. But um, everyone had so much fun. And yeah, there's some like, they kind of oh, shot like a music video amazing. out of it because they were rolling and they had the yeah. like on the crane. Oh, so they were cool. kind of like going down and then there was like a, tr like a dance train going and so the crane was getting footage of everybody dancing, going through the crowd. Oh, it looked awesome. Great. It was a music video, but it's somewhere in the abyss. Motherland, Port Salem Warehouse <laughs> music video. Yeah, lost to the Motherland iCloud somewhere. Uh, yeah, I'll be looking online for it here in the next few No months. kidding. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> do. Send um, it to me to find it. I will. Yeah, uh, definitely. You can count on that. <laughs> um, so this is this is also kind of a big question, but uh, what's been, what's, okay, so what's been either, I'll break, I'll give it to you, I'll go easy on you, I'll give you two options here. What's been <laughs> your favorite scene to do on the entire show, all three seasons, or which kinds of scenes did you maybe favor the most? Whether they were, like, wordy, dramatic scenes, where they're, like, super, like, heavy emotion, or the, did you favor maybe, like, action-y type scenes where you're strung up with wires, like, what did you like doing the most, maybe? Or what was your favorite scene out of everything, if these are, these are different things. Uh, I have different answers to both of these. So right. my favorite scene ever is still such an OG scene. And I think it was because it was something that I think really sealed um, the chemistry with Amalia. And it was the Salva scene, the very first mm -hmm. Salva scene in the pilot. And to this day, it's still one of my favorite things that we shot. We had yeah. so much fun doing it. It was yeah. gorgeous. It was beautiful outside, you know, the weather was warm and the last two seasons we shot in, uh, in the winter time. So, you know, we got to shoot this in the summer and it was balmy. It was like the perfect love setting. And they, you know, it was, they lit it so beautifully and just that push and pull of like boundaries and this isn't what we're supposed to be doing, but I know I need to be here and just playing with that and then on top of the that you know the physicality of they put us on this like giant teeter-totter and so we shot like both yeah 
we shot a part in a like a green screen room and then uh, in the studio and then part outside. So we really had so much fun playing with that. And um, the sequence they use is called a dry wet sequence. So they kind of shoot us in slow motion and then mm. they like fans at us. So we're here yeah. like we're underwater. Yep. Yeah. So it was a, it was so, so beautiful. And I think so, so important uh, to the, the way the rest of the relationship played out. I think it really set the tone. Tender beginnings. For our chemistry, yeah. <laughs> But I think that so fondly, you know, we, we both think of it a lot and talk about it. And, That's and, great. Yeah. Um, and the other one, like my favorite kind of scenes, my favorite kind of scenes to shoot are Demetria scenes. Um, Rayon and Acostia can, for some reason, never have just like a light, airy conversation. It's always the meat of the stuff, like they're yes. crying or yelling or, but it was yelling. always the most therapeutic and... Demetra is so talented. She, she, she's so talented. She shows up every time, whether it's her footage or not. I think that also speaks volumes about a creator um, is just being there and being present. You know, she never broke. She was, we, it was a team collaboration. We were, we both showed up for each other. We were both there. We both gave a hundred and um, it was nice to, it was nice that she set that tone. She, she really, um, gave a, a trust in, in our performance that, you know, felt like a safe space to really go there. I just love her. Yeah. She's, she was, she was really yeah. elusive at uh, QFX. I, I, I got, so I did a lot of um, running back and forth. I ran all over creation. I, I was running from point A to point B because, and it was great because I was, as busy as that sounds, yeah. I was one of the only outlets, one of the only media outlets there at QFX. So normally mm -hmm. I have to, normally at other events and other conventions and film festivals and stuff that I do, um, you have to kind of battle with other, I wouldn't say battle, but like you have to be present with other outlets. And especially after panels, there's, there's a thing like when, the, when a panel ends, you kind of want to be the first, you kind of want to we don't really, well, okay, we do rush the stage. Um, and you have to run down the long middle aisle. Uh, you have your camera out. You have your badge. You, you mm -hmm. flash your badge. You say, hi, I'm so-and-so. I'm with such-and-such. Uh, can I get a nice tight photo of you? Thank you very much. You're, you're great. Love you. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm. And you move out of the way for the next outlet. And there was none of that at QFX. I kind of had free oh. reign over everything. <laughs> great. I got so much content. I, wrote, oh my gosh, I published Congrats. so much. Um, yeah, definitely. But, um, and, uh, Demetria was you know, a, kind of elusive. Like I, I ran past her a couple of times and I'm wearing square toed boots. And so like, you can hear me coming and, <laughs> and she looked around her shoulder and she saw me and I'm like, hi, bye. And she's looking at me like, okay. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to stop and chat with her, but I really wanted to, I just had to be whenever the people who are running point on press mm -hmm. at that event, when, it, when they say, okay, so-and-so is free, uh, I would come running whenever they called. So yeah. do you ever get running? Shot. What's that? I, I was just saying, if you ever get a shot to pick her brain, like she's so well-spoken. She, she just has that commanding energy. When she opens her mouth, you know to shut the fuck up. <laughs> Why? Because there's something important to be said. Mm -hmm. I don't think she speaks unless she feels it's of importance. You know, I, I'm very much the opposite. You know, I, I say whatever comes that there's like, my filter is like broken. It's kind of flapping and things are just like <laughs> flying out everywhere and the mouth moves and the, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. I just, I'm guilty. <laughs> yeah. oh, it's okay. You're girl, you're in good company. It's all right. <laughs> um, well, I she's a listener and it's, there's a lot to be, I think, taken from that, but she just says, the most beautiful tidbits that I, there's so many that stick oh, with me. I've seen, yeah, definitely. Yeah, mm -hmm. I uh, I was a little a little intimidated, but like in a good way, but like, I, I, it's always good to be a little professionally intimidated. She has that like, energy. You want to do a better job, you know? Yes. But, yes. Um, she has that with everyone. You're not the only one. Don't worry, don't worry. She, she, yeah, she's just, because she has that, she just has that very mm -hmm. commanding energy naturally. And I, 
I think you can feel how powerful and wise and intelligent she is. And she's beautiful. You know, everything about her, I think, initially makes you feel a little small. But yeah. um, when she speaks, I think she has the, the very opposite effect. She can make you feel stronger and bigger. Um, it's just, she's, yeah, she's very powerful energy. I would love to have... 30 minutes just to, like you said, pick her brain for a minute. That would be, I want another 30 minutes. That would be great. <laughs> um, I want to talk about the trailer. So the trailer is just nuts. So there's so much going on. Alder is back. Tally's had this sort of terrifying, terrifying vision of the future. Apparently helicopters are crashing. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Did I hallucinate Rail and Scylla standing at the altar? What was that about? Um, as much as I can't say about that, I can say, um, it's probably not what you think it is. I think there's more, more to it than you think it is. Gosh, don't do that to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I hope it's a, a, a surprise, a pleasant surprise. I had a feeling cause that's, that's always my, that's, that's just the little voice in the back of my head that says that this, this is not what you think it is. It's trying to like talk me out of it. And I'm like, but, and, and the voice is like, no, no it's it's people, I think that have kind of, kind of figured it out on Twitter, you know, through all the bantering, but yeah. um, place your bets. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Um, that and the day five promo, um, but the, it, last thursday on the 16th the pro the one where you and or where rail and Scylla are up against the wall yeah <laughs> um so that got about one hundred forty-two thousand views which in within the first two days that is crazy <laughs> it made me i couldn't watch it i was with i was with my partner and i was like ah they took the slow oh, no. <laughs> i can't watch because it's like it's so not me when I watched that like what that assertiveness and like that really that's I think that's the masculine side that Rael is really attached to is just like forwardness and I think that's something they both share is that assertiveness and and, and dominance and um I think that's something they really enjoy playing with and like taking turns yeah. in that dynamic but um yeah it was so me and Amali always look forward to those scenes because we just have so much room to play. Like there's not, especially when it's a lot of touching, like there isn't a lot of description. So they're just, it's kind of like room for imagination. So yeah. we just talk it through and play and find out what, you know, what feels good and comfortable for, for us both and what feels playful and, you know, keeping in mind the consideration of you guys and, and, you know, what you want to see and like what you would find funny or playful or loving and, yeah, it's it's so fun to sort of talk these things through, and um, and Molly and I are like those are some of our favorite scenes to shoot because it's just it's only us that share this connection. It's like this secret, private little huddle yeah. that we have that only we're privy to, and only that we get to play with. And I think it's <laughs> it's easy to forget that a camera's there when you're doing that secret little private thing, and then. Aww. Yeah, and then of course it gets released into the world, and then you're like, "Oh my God, everybody has to see this!" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's the part that I'm like, that's that's "Oh my God!" <laughs> <laughs> it's just feels like it makes me so giddy and embarrassed. And it's like I normally have no problem now watching myself on screen. I've really gotten over that, but like yeah. I always have to avert my eyes whenever I'm watching anything intimate because it just makes me like hysterical. Like yeah. I just start giggling and I can't look oh at God. it. That's, that's so <laughs> it's so fun to make these scenes like these are some of my favorite moments to shoot because it's just it's just raw like there's no structure to it you just it's room for play it's like the most base form of you know just being present and being romantic with each other and there's no other fighting forces or outside things it's just like they get to talk about their future and what they want and it only matters oh, their feelings and wants and that little yes. time and I just think these things are to be treasured because there's always like life and death and war and bullshit going on and yeah like, you don't have totally. time for them so it's nice it's soothing. 
yeah, like so much of season two, you know, we talked about, oh, maybe we've just come from this just so we can have an idea of like where the relationship is moving through and, you know, how intimate we are and how deep we're getting and how much we're allowing each other and giving each other as we're healing from past hardships within the relationship. So it's, we didn't get as much of it. So it was nice to really have these soft moments to contrast so much of the harsh tone of under the sheet and they're talking about their future and i'm like but the farm okay that house but yes but the farm uh it's so cute they're so tender it's just that we're just eating it up it's so lovely we We had so much fun we love that we were like oh my god are you serious because i don't think it was originally well it was kind of written that way but the way that uh, Amanda Tapping wanted to shoot it, she's like, oh, yeah, like I'm making you guys a blanket for it and you guys are going to. And we were like, shut up. Are you serious? <laughs> and so it was like this beautiful little giggly protection of, you know, love and warmth. And it felt like that moment, nothing could interrupt it. It was just there. So taking- yeah. yeah, it was just like it, such a soft thing that I think is a, a rarity in the in the structure of motherland, you know, there's yeah. so much else going on that it was really nice to be allotted those moments of privacy and not have to talk about them off screen and really get to move through them and have the audience, I think, Just have a breath of relief and contra- you know, in the contrast of yeah. everything else going on, so... Just, yeah. just another thing that makes the show so incredible. You were saying earlier, Elliot has this, this whole world, the whole, everything already kind of just mapped out. Mm-hmm. Um, I was talking with um, an, a coworker of mine with Les Flix that we both kind of said in unison at the same time we were t- when we were talking about, can you imagine what other kind of stories would come from the Motherland verse? Mm-hmm. And both of us chimed in and said at the same time, we want to see young Sarah Alder. And oh. that's, that's, that's a storyline that there's, there's a lot to chew on there. Like I yes. want to see oh. how just, that's something that we both really mean this coworker. And I think a lot of people want oh, to like that. a sequel or yes, anything. Oh, it's a good spinoff. Yes. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> but that's, that's just it is like, there's so much room and possibility and potential this world is so expansive and you can look forward or backwards or sideways. And there's, there's more information to be. So many different things oh, that could be going yes. on. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, I love that you're interested in that because these are the kind of conversations we have in like the green room where we really oh, cool. get into it. But like, it's so nice to hear other people care, you know, and, and that's stuff that they want to see too. It just like, it again, speaks so much to the investment of, of everyone and what makes it feel like such a community i would watch the heck out of that hands down (laughs) (laughs) um so i did get a chance to interview arlen who plays nikta Mm -hmm. uh, and diana who played dear old mom um (laughs) at qfx and arlen had vaguely mentioned something about in season three where cooking or a kitchen is involved Mm-hmm. Um, is because we were talking about um, how, okay, so everybody's a fugitive now going into season three and how uh, we were going back and forth on how the unit may kind of struggle to stay together. And with Nikta along for the ride, uh, she said that there, she kind of, she said that there are too many cooks in the kitchen because mm-hmm. there are personalities probably that might be clashing. Um, And she also alluded to that having some type of maybe literal significance in season three. Yeah. Yeah. There is, there is definitely a literal significance there. Um, It is so hard to explain without. We're just going to have to watch and find out, I guess. Yes. Um, But yeah, it does impact a lot of the story. I think uh, it has a lot. The story, I think it would be a a big surprise for sure. and it surprised me. I'll say that. Like, it surprised me. Um, yeah, but I definitely think I'm that looking forward thematically to that. that is present, for sure. I can, I can affirm. <laughs> so, yeah. So, going off of that, what are your thoughts on everyone being together at this point? You know, working towards the same goal 
Uh, they might have different ways of doing things, obviously. Um, but, you know, are there personalities that are clashing? Like, what is what is that going to look like? Um, yes and no. I think there's a lot of challenging. Um, I, but I think everything plays out the way it's meant to for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. I think that's a good uh, good thing to trust in. I'm also probably the worst and funniest person to ask because so much uh of the sort of beginning half of shooting i wasn't present so i was in a car accident and it gave me a head injury that gave me a lot of amnesia and uh it took me a long time to come back from uh, i took three months off work so of course that impacted our storyline um i didn't understand the gravity of my injuries initially and i was very persistent on coming back to work uh I didn't want to miss a moment of, you know, the, the conclusion of motherland. I was trying to soak up everything and I wanted to be there and I wanted to be part of the team. And I felt guilty being a missing piece and, and not being able to give to that. And I, you know, selfishly was worried, like, well, what's going to happen? It's like, oh, yeah. what always happens. They work as a team, you know, and through doing that, um, I commend Motherland so much for um, for seeing what I needed before I did. And uh, it really taught me to learn how to ask for help because I wanted so badly to, to, to be a leader and to be strong. And um, apparently I hadn't learned anything from Motherland. And, um, you know, my toxically masculine traits just wanted to sort of suppress the pain and the healing that I needed to do and just sort of march forward and be a warrior and I mm -hmm. okay. yeah no, I, I and that. yeah so they allotted me a lot of healing time and That's I needed it I, mm -hmm. I you know graciously thank them so much now um but of course it impacted the storyline so you know they okay they worked really hard and really quickly to to adjust and make something that worked so that I could take the time off and so that they could continue working so you know i our writers team is just bloody brilliant because having to do that within like a week of all of this happening oh, yeah completely shifting the trajectory of the story and still making it so beautiful and oh yeah i'm sure better than before you know i but i miss so much of it so like i I, I couldn't even read. I was in the dark. I was in, you know, I had a, a pretty severe head injury. So for about a month and a half, you know, I wasn't leaving my house. I wasn't really yeah. standing. I couldn't walk up or, or walk around or stand up or move, you know, move about my own house for longer than like a minute at a time. So it was, it was I'm quite so glad you're okay. Me too. Me too. <laughs> it was, I've had a lot of head injuries. So I think that's why this one was so debilitating um but I wasn't expecting it you know I you know it's always like two weeks later I'm I'm like okay yeah I'm on my feet I, I have some dizziness I have some other things and I I, I just kept collecting residual symptoms and then mm -hmm. this happened um head injury and unfortunately it you know it taught me that if I won't take the time to awesome. heal my body will take it for me yep. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I know Maybe exactly right. what you mean. Yeah, I I was a kickboxer. Hard lesson. I, I, I got my bell rung plenty of times. I know exactly yeah. because, you know, I wanted to be able to show up and to train yeah. and to, you know, it's it's a, a passion of mine and mm -hmm. staying active like that and wouldn't give myself enough downtime to be able to let my body, you know, like you said, your body will make that time for you. You'll yep. put you right on your ass. I'm so glad mm. you're okay though. The world needs more people like you. You can't go anywhere. Don't do that. <laughs> I couldn't do anything. I was like, I felt so infantile and helpless. Mm. and I had no control over my emotions. It was like so out of body and I don't remember so much, which I think is, was one of the scariest things for me. It was just like the lack of information retention I had I couldn't remember anything I had trouble having conversations it was so scary and I hadn't really had anything that um that severe that I had noticed from my past concussions and you know it really really one one it taught me a lot it's, yeah. I, I really I I had to be cared for and I I'm I think I'm used to assuming that role in my life I'm 
Mm -hmm. I'm used to being the caretaker. I'm used yeah. to being the one that's responsible for other people, especially as an older sibling. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. so true. Yeah. And for the first time, like I really had to rely on people bringing food to me, things like that were menial, helping me walk to the bathroom. It was just like, you know, I really had to ask for help. And it was like, I really had to put my pride aside. But there's something that Motherland, I think, saw before I did. And I'm so grateful that I got that that time off because when I did return to work, I was able to show up fully myself. And uh, yeah. you know, they were very gentle with me and provided a gradual return to, you know, our long hours and um, being out in the weather and whatnot. And they were so careful. And one of, one of the cutest things they did was they created like a little Zen tent for me. Cause one of the problems I had was, being uh, hyper stimulated or over stimulated, mm -hmm. and I would just shut down. It was the strangest thing, but basically, if there was too much noise or sensory uh, overload, that I just could talk, and I would just sort of shut down and have an anxiety attack. It was bizarre. Um, but so they would create this little scent tent for me everywhere we went. And they put a little couch and they lit it up with lights and like little Moroccan scarves hanging and plants and a rug and. It was just like above and beyond, you know, that they, they just went to care for me. It was like our set deck and props team just went above to. That's so amazing. I'm so glad they took care of you in that way. That's, <laughs> that's incredible. It's great it to have a so job like that too. I mean, it made me so emotional that I was, you know, I was just like, but that's it. That's like, that's what we, that's what we do for each other. I, I, people really looked out for me and. Uh, that's good. That's yeah, so amazing. grateful. But I missed a lot of that storytelling and I couldn't read the scripts even at the time. So I was kind of like listening to what people were conveying to me, but I didn't retain a lot of it because of my injury. So I'm really going to be watching as an audience member from like probably three to six. I think I don't know much of what's going on in there. Okay. And I think okay. I went back and shot um, some of the stuff that Rail's right. doing at the time, you know, because... Mm -hmm my character is a bit separated and um, and so I got to sh sh go back and shoot it way later on but and so I think they peppered it through but uh, I'm not sure what goes where like I was a bit okay. still confused so I'll, I'll definitely be watching as an audience member oh, fun. very interesting yeah <laughs> all right <laughs> well, sure. uh, so yeah so speaking of cooking because um, we were just talking about the yeah 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 some literal significance about a kitchen scene and how it's impactful somehow. Yeah. Um, I know we already mentioned the farm and the the million little witch babies again. Congratulations and the ducks. <laughs> but I want to know what Rail and Scylla are in this scenario. Who is the better cook? Scylla. Yeah, I, I mean, think I'm taught her. But also, I don't, my character probably really had to fend for herself. I feel like my mom would have been the cook. And then, you know, when she was gone or when we thought she had passed, that maybe Raelle sort of assumed that the role of independence and um, also taking care of her father, too. Yeah, you know, okay. yeah. maybe kind of had to trial by fire and learn how to cook. I mean, I can, maybe they cook together. Um, I, that's what I think they do. I, I mean, that's kind of what my partner and I do. We, we do it together. So I think that's kind of how I pictured it, honestly. I can, I can see that kitchen and that little farmhouse or maybe the ranch being an absolute mess. You know, I think Sarah probably <laughs> dances while she cooks and Rael thinks it's super cute. Yeah, Rael's got, she wipes a spoon on her jeans and stuff. <laughs> It'd be that kind of thing. Totally see that. Sauce everywhere. Yeah. That's Absolutely. great. <laughs> Um, are you aware of the online petition to save the show? I am. My mom is very enthusiastic about it. <laughs> she keeps me updated. Oh my God. Like, so this many now? It's like, awesome. Yeah. They just broke 26,000 26, signatures. Holy Amazing. cow. Um, yeah, people very much want the show to go on. Uh, and of course, for you to continue to have a job, but... <laughs> It's uh, th that's fan base for you. That's crazy. I mean, yeah, there's a few of us who, I mean, me and Jess and I have really been, um, like, we've especially had a hard time. We've talked about it quite a bit. You know, I think every, a lot of um, our team kind of went off to other jobs immediately. And um, I've really 
I haven't yet. So I've really been sort of sitting with my feelings and, um, and I'm grateful for it. I wouldn't want to hop right onto a show. I think I need the time to absorb. And I'm also enjoying this ride still. This, this show isn't, you know, the last of it isn't even out yet. And yeah. these conventions I want to go to. And I, I feel like jumping into something else would, I would have required to emotionally close a chapter in order for me to focus. And I, I don't think I'm ready to let that's go of valid. that. I'm still I, I feel like that's valid. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I just, there's probably some also hopeful side of me that, you know, like all of us, I you know, wants the show to continue. And um, of course we need a, we need a Sarah Alder spinoff for sure. <laughs> I'm going to be pitching that for a while with the, the connection. I'll sign that have. petition. So when you make that petition, send it to me because I'll yeah. sign it under like eight different emails. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. Of course. So here's uh, one last question for you, Taylor, mm -hmm. as, as yourself. Mm -hmm. um, Tay, if you were a witch living in the motherland verse, would you be, obviously, four choices, um, would you be a fixer? Like Rael, would you be a knower? Like Tally, would you be a blaster or would you be necro? I think I I've had trouble deciding. I'm quite aloof, so I don't think I would be a knower. I I really rely on my introverted, intuitive friends to keep me from danger because I'm like be running into everything. I would definitely be a knower, so I, I'll take care of you. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'd eliminate that, and then I always think I'm really tough, but I think I'm like more like one of those yappy small dogs. So I'm <laughs> not a blaster, <laughs> but I think a healer or a necro would probably be, be likely. Um, I love change. I love regeneration. Um, and it, I think they're, you know, they work in tandem as a cycle. Yeah. Healing and That's beautiful, yeah. life and then death. Um, so, you know, I, I love change. I love stimulation. Um, and the metamorphosis of death or, you know, releasing something to make room for something new. That's kind of where I'm at right now, you know. And it's like, but you still hold on to the core parts of things in order to to be bigger and better in the next life cycle of something. So I don't know, maybe necro because I really am attached to change and I think it's difficult, but it's something that okay. I enjoy so much. And I think um, without change and without death, there can't be life. There can't be growth. That's very beautifully said. Very, <laughs> very poetic. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Um, yeah, definitely. I would definitely be a knower. Like, I, like you can guide me as a knower then <laughs> to get to where I need to be. Yeah. Well, awesome. Uh, congratulations again, Tay, on season three of Motherland Fort Salem. It was, it was such a, such a good time. Really great to see you again. We'll have to chat again once we've seen everything so that we can actually talk about everything. Yes. Since you're inclined to do more conventions, and I'm always covering those, so I'll run into you again. Yes, I'm <laughs> sure of it. I'm positive of it. I'll see you soon. Well, thanks so much for showing up and taking time out of your busy schedule to sit and talk with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, friend. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. <laughs> For those of you watching or reading at home and you're a fan of Motherland Fort Salem and you want to watch similar sapphic content, I'd love to tell you about Lesflix Video On Demand. Lesflix VOD is the world's largest streaming catalog of lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and queer films, shorts, and series. My personal recommendation for a sci-fi series we currently have streaming is called Passage. Go check it out. Until next time, my name again is Sarah Caitlin. I'm a writer for lesbooks.com. I'm a public speaker and a traveling advocate for positive LGBT representation in film and media. Be sure to follow Lesflix on social media to read or watch more interviews just like this and for more queer fan convention and film festival exclusives. Mm -hmm.